people have actually used OpenShift before? How many people have used OpenShift 3 before? How many people have used Docker before? Okay. There we go. How about Rocket? No, no Rocket. Docker's dead. Rocket's the new hotness. <laughs> like SpaceX or which one? Rocket is CoreOS's, uh, so Rock, or CoreOS got angry with Docker just like everyone else in the world. And so they created their own container system called Rocket, RKT, um, that uh, actually aligns more with what Red Hat's trying to do. And so they released version 1.0 a couple days ago. So it's, it's just a competing container format. It probably won't ever take off, but it's kind of cool if you like playing around with stuff. All right. Um, so I'm just going to give a few slides at the beginning, and then most of this morning is actually going to be hands-on stuff, okay? Um, I have a lab that we'll work through. So if you have your own laptop, it's uh, good to, to run through it. I created user accounts for everyone on an OpenShift 3 instance. Um, if I talk too fast, let me know, um, but give you some background on what we're trying to do with OpenShift 3 
is you guys have probably all seen this, but the world has been changing, especially in the last 15 years. We're going through one of the most disruptive times in the human race, believe it or not. Okay, More uh, techno technology ha is changing everything about our lives, Okay, more so than any other thing in the past, except maybe fire and uh, perhaps the will. I don't know. Anything else you guys can think of that has changed uh, population so much? Yeah, I don't know. All right, so just to illustrate this, this is a picture from 2005. It's a group of people, um, and you can see this is 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago. What's interesting about this picture is this guy down here has a flip phone. You guys remember these? I don't know what we did on flip phones. I guess we called people. Imagine that, talking to people on the phone. I used to, uh, when I had a flip phone, somebody would text me. You know, you'd have to hit the two button three times to get to C or whatever. You guys remember this, right? Yeah. And someone would text me and I'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? Don't text me. Like, just call me if you want to talk to me. And now, if someone calls me, I reject the call and say, why don't you just text me? I don't want to talk to you, <laughs> right? And so things are changing. Right here's another one, and up here's another one. I have no idea what they're doing on these things, because it looks like they're taking a picture, maybe. I don't know. She's got her hand on the, the middle, and I don't know. So let's fast forward eight years to 2013. Uh, this is what the scene looks like. Right? And so everyone is using these connected devices now, and living their life through their screen. My kids uh, play soccer, and uh, they're on teams with soccer. And I go and I watch their soccer games on the sidelines, and I just turn around and I look at all the parents, and they're watching the game through their fucking phone. And it drives me crazy, right? Just put your phone down and watch the game. Um, but that's kind of the world we live in now. This guy, look at this guy. He's even got a tablet out. He's pretty cool, right? <laughs> and so, so things are changing. We're going through a digital disruption in the entire world now. And today, you guys have probably seen this, but the uh, maybe not so much in check. I don't know if you guys have this or not, but the world's largest taxi provider doesn't actually own any taxis. Who's that? Uber. Uber. That's right. The world's largest media company today doesn't actually create or own content. Who would that be? Facebook. That's exactly right. But I have prizes. Why am I not giving out prizes? <laughs> I should give some prizes. Up. These things are pretty cool. Actually, I don't know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> They're little, so they got to be cool. What is it? A key? Do you have a key? Oh, it's a USB drive. Okay. Is it not going to explode? <laughs> it's probably got. Uh, are you running Windows? Yes, I am. Then it's loaded with viruses for you. There you go. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Then. <laughs> All right, so it is Facebook. Um, yeah. There's a lot. I don't think you are supposed to run over the flash disk because they are for the workshop. They contain the images, but you have scars there to. Is that what it is? Give me that yeah. flash drive back. <laughs> I don't, do we have anything on the images? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'll give you something. <laughs> ah, you get a scarf. There we go. Cheers. <laughs> well, thank you. I probably would have screwed up someone's workshop later today. <laughs> All right. The world's uh, most valuable retailer doesn't actually own the products they sell. Who's that? Amazon. Who? Amazon. Amazon. Nope. Amazon actually owns and have warehouses of all of their stuff. eBay. Nope. Alibaba from China. Is it, is it bigger than eBay? It is bigger than eBay and Amazon. Really? Mm -hmm. Yep. The world's largest accommodation provider doesn't actually own any real estate. Anyone know this one? Airbnb. That's right. Was that you, Ling Ching? Yay! <laughs> yep, Airbnb. And so we are going through this digital disruption where 
all of these traditional uh, industries are getting uh, disrupted by software companies. So the price, are you guys familiar with what a taxi medallion is? Okay, so to drive a taxi in, say, New York City, you have to buy this medallion that hangs from your uh, mirror that lets you know you're a certified taxi driver. And the price of those since Uber has uh, came on the scene has been reduced. I think they used to be a million dollars just to drive a taxi, right? Um, really? And then you pay really? it off over time. So you don't have to pay the money up front. But those have reduced in price dramatically. And so software companies are able to compete in any industry just with a few guys who have this great idea and can develop software faster than traditional enterprises. How many people work at Red Hat? Do you feel like sometimes it takes us forever to get something out to production after it's coded? Like we struggle with this as well. When I used to manage IT at Red Hat, if we wanted to update the website, it would literally take us from code finished about two and a half to three months to actually get it out live. Just because of all the process and the, all this stuff that, that large companies do. And so a lot of large companies are being disrupted because they can't compete with the speed at which smaller companies can release things to production. And so what these large companies are saying now, or believing, which is not true, is that <laughs> containers are going to solve all of their problems. All we have to do is start using Docker containers and everything is magically going to be better. Well, it's not, right? It's Docker and containers are just a tool. And they, they will help you uh, deploy software faster, but the problem comes in with the orchestration <laughs> of these containers, right? And so what we see and what I see a lot is a group of developers learn Docker and they understand the power of it, but then they start to realize they need to actually deploy these containers into production, and so they begin to develop their own container orchestration system. Okay, the result of that is their container does get deployed out to production, right? Um, but their data center end up kind of looking like this. They have containers thrown around everywhere. They're hard to manage. They don't have visibility into them. They don't know how long the container has been running or what it's used for. Where, where is that picture from? This one? No, no, the this one. I have no idea. I stole it from the internet. Wow, that's massive. This picture is from the internet. <laughs> there, that answers your question. And so, you know, eventually if you're developing your own orchestration system, there's a lot of really smart engineers out there who can do this inside their company um, and get their containers uh, deployed correctly, um, but it's not their core competency, right? There's no need for us as an industry to write our own custom orchestration engines when some, you know, industry standards out there exist. And so what I see with companies who develop their own is their infrastructure eventually reaches this tipping point, right? To where they de deploy all of their containers and orchestrate them to their environment, but they lose control at some point. And so what we wanted to do on OpenShift is uh, partner with Google on the Kubernetes project, which is their uh, orchestration uh, project that, that they created. And so on OpenShift, we actually uh, contribute heavily to the Kubernetes project because our goal is to, develop, or to deliver your containers in the same manner to your data center so that it ends up looking like this instead. You have visibility into where your containers are, what they're actually running, so you can manage them, uh, get some statistics on them. And that's, you know, two pieces of the puzzle, right? When you think about development workflows um, in the container world, you have the actual container system itself, um, which in our case is Docker. Um, then you have the orchestration engine, which is Kubernetes. Um, but that's only two pieces of the puzzle. What we actually wanted to do was create a new platform that adds on top of those to make Docker and Kubernetes uh, easy to use from a developer's perspective. And so when we started doing this, we had to change our development model. We've actually been working on OpenShift 3 for about really two years, year and a half, two years. But most of that time has been spent working on 
the Docker upstream project, the Kubernetes upstream project. And so we did actually change our development model to work all in the upstream projects, um, which is why it's taken us uh, quite a while to get the first version out. Because we don't want developers to be using containers and deploy things out there, but then just leaving them laying around and, and not actually using them on a daily basis, because that's of, of no benefit. What we actually want developers to do is to be able to create great things with containers. And this is my favorite one, because it's a bar made out of a container. Um, so, so that's what we're going to learn today is the platform we've created. It is all open source. It's called Open Shift Origin. And the real goal, honestly, is kind of summed up with this picture. Right. Is everyone familiar with these two guys? This represents uh, development and operations. Okay. Who's who? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? Who's Darth Vader? Development. Yeah. Development. You're wrong. <laughs> no, you're wrong. The operations. <laughs> no. Operations is absolutely Darth Vader. <laughs> Development is Luke Skywalker, because we're the nice guys. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding, obviously. But, um, it is this tool that will allow these two groups to get along better, meaning that operations maintains the platform. They have full control over it. They get to decide your quotas, um, what languages you can use. But then after they set these rules in place, uh, developers are free to self-service within those rules. So if they want to spin up, you know, 10 containers all running Node.js, they can do so without having to call the operations team. Because what I realized when I managed the operations team uh, in IT at Red Hat is that uh, sysadmins have more important things to worry about than spinning up development environments. And that's why it always takes them so long to do it is because they're actually working on real things, right? And so development environments kind of get pushed down their priority list. And so with a uh, project like OpenShift, they're able to set it up initially and then let developers do it themselves without having to, to call us in the middle of the night. Okay, so that's enough of me talking. <laughs> so now what we're gonna do is uh, start the workshop. And so everyone does need to be on Wi-Fi for this. And I want everyone to go to, uh, let's, let me open a console here. Ah, wrong screen. Go to this URL. And I'll pull it back up in just a second. I screwed up my uh, zoom level here. There we go. And it should look like this. Run cloud run. Run cloud run dot com. Training dot run cloud run dot com slash dev com. Yeah, because in the console that's just run cloud. Mm. Sorry. Run cloud run dot com. Thank you, sir. It is also 3.19 a.m. for me, so you got to cut me some, some slack right now. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about this environment is, let me switch here. Maybe my internet died. Um, this is running OpenShift. 3.1.1.1.1.1.1 or whatever the latest version is. Um, we installed this cluster a couple days ago. It is running in open or in Amazon EC2 
Ireland, I believe, um, was the closest one. It has one master, um, which is the Kubernetes master, one what we call infrastructure node that contains things like the Docker registry, um, any other packages that we need to install. Um, and then we have five OpenShift nodes, which you can also think of as Kubernetes minions. Okay, and don't worry if you don't understand what these terms are, we're going to get into it a little bit. Um, so, has everyone been able to get to the site so far? Okay. So, the first thing we want to do is install the OC client tool. This is lab one, you can read through it. And so, um, the way I like to normally do things is just have you guys work through it, and then uh, if when you have questions, just yell at me. But I'll walk through each lab and then give everyone five or ten minutes to do it. Okay, so you're actually learning how to do things. The OC command line tool, I linked out to GitHub so you can get the latest version here. The only requirement for the OC tool set is a 64-bit operating system. If you're running a 32-bit uh, operating system, let me know. Are you? Linux package is missing. The Linux package yeah. is missing. Oh, the Windows is too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's because we changed our repo server. So let me get the new. Uh, I'm ready to get this car. <laughs> <laughs> let me get the new. If you go to blog.openshift.com, the first post you see, I wrote whatever yesterday or the day before, two days ago. Click on that link, and I link to the GitHub version down here in the middle, right here. These same links will go to GitHub, okay? And so this, you can download the latest version here. Does that make sense? blog.openshift.com So go here, click on the first link using OpenShift 3 on your local environment. Scroll down till you see the Microsoft Windows, Linux, and OS X and download the correct one. Okay, so this binary is written in the Go programming language. Um, the previous version of OpenShift, everything was written in Ruby, which we called OpenShift 2. We basically threw all of that code away and rewrote it entirely in Go. Um, so we didn't save a single line of code, actually. One of the benefits of that is that to install the client tools on the previous version of OpenShift, you, it required like Ruby and, and all these other dependencies. So we got our rid of that by using Go. And so it's now, not, now it requires Go and all other dependencies. It doesn't require anything. It's a <laughs> self-contained uh, binary for your operating system. So there's actually nothing to install. In this lab we're just going to download that binary and then add it to your path. Okay. For Windows, uh, or sorry, for Linux and uh, OS X it's very easy. You just change the path. If I go back here to the Roadshow document. Um, you just add it to your path. On Windows, changing your path is considered an advanced topic. Okay, according to Microsoft. Um, well, of course it is. And so I gave instructions on how to do it for Windows 10, but for o other versions of Windows, it's different. So I just link out to blog posts on how to do that. Okay, so uh, to verify that you have this lab completed, what you can do is come to your <laughs> Uh, command line and type OC dash version and if you get this doesn't have to be the same version yours will be slightly newer than mine you know that you have the OC tools ready to go okay so I'm gonna give everyone five minutes to do this when you have problems just raise your hand and me or Graham or Jorge will come around and help you okay
Okay, so, I mean, like, this is uh, the source of the thing. Yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. But I don't know how to. Uh, 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 yeah. 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 For the uh or the towel. Okay. Is anyone else having problems downloading it? What version it should supposed to be with uh, it doesn't matter. Oh, uh, because it says O C V one one one. Yeah, that's the latest. Yeah. <laughs> of course. I I'm using an older version. Uh, <laughs> three point one, that's that's obviously an older one. Yeah, yeah I'm using three one oh. I just got it. Here, here, just did a one, 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 one. Yeah, that makes sense. Just did it. 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 Just to se to nikdo nevěděl. Musím podívat. Ne, o tak to není tak jako Ale to se dělá, já jsem koukal na to, jsem tak se A do zdraví jako dvou kůžiků. To se hlavou. All right, I'm going to use the same, let me download the same client tools. I just want to make sure that I'm using the same one you guys are. This is what everyone's seen? The same version? Okay. Now, disclaimer. I've never tested these new version of the client tools. These are the uh, OpenShift Origin client tools, and we're actually going to be using them against OpenShift Enterprise. So this will be fun. Um, but it should work because it's the exact same code base, right? There's no difference between the open source Origin and the one that Red Hat sells. Absolutely no difference, okay? All right, so everyone have this working? If so, let's uh, move on here to lab number, wait, did we do everything here? Yes, we did. Okay, to lab two, smoke testing the environment. Okay, this is where we're actually going to log in to OpenShift for the first time. Okay, this is the URL, is there a whiteboard in here? There is. 
Is there whiteboard markers? No. No? No more try. try. Uh, Pretty short URL, right? Sorry, I didn't make it. Okay, so in this lab, we're actually going to log in for the first time. But in order to do that, you're going to need usernames and passwords. Okay? Um, I created one for everybody, and this is going to take us five minutes to get through. Um, so what I'm going to do is just point and tell you your username, okay? I tried to print some stuff up, but it didn't work, okay? So is anyone not going to be doing the labs? Okay, so if you're not doing them when I get to you, just tell me and I'll skip past you, okay? So you, user, user, all lowercase, and then a number. So you will be user 01 is your Okay. User. You're 02, 03, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09, 0, 09. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, Ling Ching, you're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 31, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, no? DevComp. Who said that? Your password is DevComp. You get a scar. <laughs> Very secure password, right? Okay, so in this lab, we're just going to check and make sure that the environment's working for you. And so I'll show you how to do this real quick. Now let me make this larger here. I'm going to say OC login dash dash server uh, equals HTTPS open shift dash master dot dev comp uh, open shift three roadshow dot com. It's going to ask me for my username. I am user zero zero. And it's going to ask me for my password and I'm going to say dev comp. And you should see one project, user, and then your user number, and smoke. It's called a smoke test. It's a saying that we have. Now, why did I create your usernames uh, with a zero, 00? And why is your smoke project different than mine? Yours will be user 01-smoke, and so on. That's because in OpenShift, project names have to be unique across the in entire environment. So there can't be two projects named, you know, my project. There can only be one. So each project name has to be unique. Every project we create, make sure to start it with your username, like this example, okay? So in this lab, we're going to log in and let me know when you have problems. You may be asked to uh, accept a self-signed certificate. If you do, just say yes if you trust me. Um, this is wrong right here. Anytime you see this URL, it is the one that's on the board, mm -hmm. okay? Um, we're going to look at the web console. So the web console is that URL. So if I go to openshift-master.devconf.openshift3roadshow, 
you will be uh, presented with a login screen, same username and password. And what I want you to do once you get into the web console is actually just poke around. You should have two containers running, okay? And you can go into browse and, you know, look at the pods or whatever you want to do. Just spend, you know, 10 minutes just poking around the, the UI. Don't delete anything, um, but just, you can open up a terminal on the pod itself. Yeah, we do some stuff here. Don't delete anything, though. I'm, I'm user ID 100006000. And so that's all we're trying to do during this lab is just make sure your account works and the environment's working for you, okay? I'm going to give everyone 10 minutes on this just because I do want you to play around in the web <coughs> console a little bit. And while you guys are doing this, I am going to talk through kind of some of the core concepts that um, you need to understand to, to know the internals of the platform. So you can pay attention or not. I think it's, it's in the lab guide as well, so you can just read it later. If I go to the overview page, this has a couple of things on it, okay? The first one is the default route for my application the entry point into the load balancer for my code. So if I click this link, it is public on the internet, it actually routes through the um, load balancer to one of my pods. Okay, so what what is a pod? These are pods. Right now we have two of them, okay? A pod is a Kubernetes concept that basically just means a Docker container, okay? So Kubernetes takes a Docker container or an image and wraps it inside of a pod. And so instead of talking about you know, how many containers are running, we always say how many pods are running. Um, to get a little complicated, you can have more than one Docker container running in the same pod. So if you wanted like um, an Apache server and a MySQL database, you can do that in the same pod. Um, but we say that is a bad practice and not to do that. Okay. The reason we say that's bad practice is because one of the benefits of running a container platform like OpenShift is the ability to scale pieces independently. And you scale based on the pod level. So if I had my web server and my database in the same pod <coughs> and I only wanted to scale my web server, I would have to scale them both. Does that make sense? So if you separate your database into a pod and your web server in a pod, you can scale independently. Maybe you have a, a heavy computations in the database and you want to scale that up and have more replicas, then you can do it that way. Okay. This route, this entry point into the load balancer, uh, gets created for you by OpenShift when you create something. We'll get into that. Um, let's see. It uses this Docker image, user 00 smoke. So We'll get into this as well. Every time you create something in OpenShift, we build Docker images on the fly for you and push them to the registry. These are just standard Docker images. Um, we have builds and the ports, okay? So that's all I'm going to talk about right now. We're going to get into all of this stuff in more detail in just a few minutes. So we'll give everybody another five minutes here. Is anyone having problems logging in? Probably the Wi-Fi, it's so slow. Yeah. I know, it sucks. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. I have a hard line, you can come up and use the hard line. Yeah, come on up. Yeah, just plug into this one. It sucks. I'm, I'm actually using my phone. Well, I gave up on the conference Wi-Fi. Isn't cloud awesome? Right? It's, it's uh, all dependent on the network connection. I love it. Especially on a trade. Yeah. <laughs> I will say this, though. One of the, even though using stuff like this, you are dependent on the uh, internet sucks, 
Um, I kicked off a build of a Java EE application the other night. As soon as the build started, I just shut my screen, right? Because I didn't need to like watch it. So that was pretty cool. Just uh, here's a chair. <laughs> Now, now that you're on the hard line, you have to set up a Wi-Fi uh, connection for everyone based off of your laptop, okay? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So the application. What? No, you didn't finish up <coughs> what you were. What was I saying? Uh, about um, starting the build of uh, Java EE. Oh, so I started the build and then I just shut my laptop, uh, which disconnected the internet, and my build was still going because it didn't have to be connected while it was happening. Okay. Does anyone need more time on this? Okay. Oh, this is going to be. I have to go like this. Okay. So let's go to the next lab here. Yeah. All right, so the next lab is deploying your first Docker image, okay? How many people have never deployed a Docker container before? Okay, after this lab, you will be Red Hat Certified Docker Deployment Engineer Cloud Specialist Level 7. Okay. And I can print seven. Level 7, and I'll print you up a certificate. Do you want to do the password? Did you really set up a... Yeah, it's a hot, hot spot. Oh, he did really set up a hot spot. <laughs> so you can connect to his if you want. Is he one? Just sorry, the university really asked us not to do this because of their <laughs> policy, so please don't, I really don't use the hard line for the difficult. Okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> we haven't heard that. <laughs> Do you, this guy, I can't give away USB sticks. We can't set up hotspots. <laughs> what? Okay, I'll turn it off. <laughs> yeah, fine. Okay, so in this lab, one of the uh, cool things about OpenShift is you can deploy any Docker um, container or Docker image. If you're not familiar with this thing called Docker Hub, it's basically kind of like GitHub, but for Docker images, okay? So anything you would want in the world has probably already been created out there. And so we do support the ability to run uh, images straight from Docker Hub with some restrictions, okay? So the environment that I created, I set a setting that does not allow uh, Docker <coughs> containers to be run from external repositories if they run as the root user, okay? So unfortunately, that's quite a few Docker images today run as privileged users. Um, if you do want to allow that, you just turn it off. There's a, just a little setting. The reason we don't allow it by default is because um, a study was done by a company called Banyan Research that found that uh, just over 40% of the official Docker images, so official meaning uh, MongoDB from MongoDB, the company itself, or Fedora from Red Hat, over 40% of the official images had known security vulnerabilities in them, and they run as the root user. So we just decided by default not to allow that, and then to let the users or the administrators make the decision whether they wanted to allow that or not. So that being said, we are going to run a Docker uh, container straight from um, Docker Hub down here towards the bottom. And we're going to deploy the famous Kubernetes guestbook application. So we're going to say OC new dash project. Remember to use your username here. Call it guestbook. And then all we're going to do is say OC new app Kubernetes guestbook. And what this is going to do 
is it specifies the namespace you can think of that we're going to pull this Docker image from and the name of the Docker image. Kubernetes is the Docker Hub user ID of the Kubernetes project. And so we're going to know that we don't have this image in our registry. So we're going to go out to the public Docker Hub registry, look for this user, and then pull down this image, and then run it. Okay. And at the uh, once you get this ran, I believe I have this Docker image cached. So we're not going to actually hit the public internet to pull this down. Otherwise, it'd be too slow. Um, you can see that down towards the bottom, let's see what I'm doing here, that we're going to have this guestbook application running, okay? However, it's not going to be accessible yet because we're not going to create a default route, okay? Uh, it's going to be running, but it's not going to be accessible on the public internet until the next lab, okay? So I'll give everyone five minutes to do this lab, and I'll... Uh, I'll try to do it here as well. Let me turn my chair around. So I'm going to say OC new project. I'm user 00, and I'm going to say guestbook. What happened? That worked. Yeah. Okay, so now I have this user uh, 00, 00 guestbook, which I should be using. Now I can just say OC new app, pass in Kubernetes dash guestbook. This is going to pull that image down and run it. Okay. So now I have this thing running OC status. And I have a deployment running. If I go to the web console here, and go into my guestbook project, I can see that I have a deployment going. I guess it's also possible to make it uh, using the the web console. It is, yeah, it is. Yeah, you would just go to add the project. Click that button. Uh, actually, actually, you in this version that I have deployed, you cannot deploy a Docker image from Docker Hub on the web console in this version. Okay. You can in the the most recent one. Does anyone need more time on this one? It's fairly quick. Okay, let's move on. So now we have this guestbook application running, but we see right here that there's no public URL. It just lists the service. And so what we need to do is expose this service as a route. So to do that, what you can do on the command line is do OC get services or SVC for short and this will list all of the services. You can think of a service as the load balancer. Okay, It's the entry point to your application and we want to expose this as a route. So to do that all you have to do is this is the name of the service is expose this service. So you say OC expose service or you can use SVC for short and say guestbook. And this will create a route for us. And if I go back to the web console, you'll see that it automatically updates with a publicly accessible URL. So if I click that, we can see the guestbook application. Now it's not going to actually work right now because 
the guestbook application is uses a Redis database, which we don't have yet. Okay. So I'll let everyone get that working. Just to make sure that you're finished with this lab, you should see this page in the browser. Okay. I know it's a beginner question, but mm -hmm. um, you already mentioned OpenShift Origin, mm -hmm. which is the source code for the uh, OpenShift platform, mm -hmm. and uh, the OpenShift Enterprise. Um, I mean, like, uh, is there any... The OpenShift Enterprise, is it uh, just the cloud? So the, the uh, question already is, deployed to what's the difference between OpenShift Origin and Enterprise? No, yeah, yeah, and uh, maybe are there any other OpenShifts? Yeah, so there's three, actually three versions of OpenShift. There's OpenShift Origin, which is the upstream OpenShift project and OpenShift Enterprise. Those two are exactly the same, except for this. This says OpenShift Enterprise, and the open source version says OpenShift Origin. Okay, mm -hmm. other than that, they are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. The only difference is OpenShift Enterprise, um, when you purchase it, comes with support. Oh, I see, yes. Yeah, from but, Red Hat. But I still have to sort of uh, download it, and I'll have to deploy it to Amazon or my local Correct. computer or whatever. You still have to run it yourself. Yes. We also have what's called OpenShift, OpenShift Online. Online. Now that makes sense. Okay, thanks. So, Open. If you go to openshift.com, this is OpenShift Online. This is uh, where we provide the hardware as well and host it. This is version 2 right now. Okay. Still version 2. Version 2. We have OpenShift Online, if you're not familiar with it. The reason it's still version 2 is we have... What's our latest number? 2 million applications running on it. Yeah, 1.8 to 2 million applications running on it. We process over a billion requests per day just to the public Red Hat cloud through OpenShift. And to migrate all of those users over, it's, uh, it's not an easy task, right? And uh, so what we are going to do is just stand up a separate environment called uh, OpenShift Online 3. And uh, we're going to, what can I say about this? It's going to be coming very soon um, in a developer <laughs> preview. But we're not going to self-migrate people over. We're going to uh, let them do it on their own time. And then we'll eventually turn off the current OpenShift online in like a year or two from now once everyone has migrated over. Um, but it still will be free to use um, when, we, when we push it out there. And then OpenShift dedicated is if you're a company that doesn't want to run your own hardware, Red Hat's sysadmin uh, manages your OpenShift environment for you. So there's actually four different versions. But it's all, it's all the same code, exactly, except OpenShift Online will uh, not have an authentication mechanism. It will require developers authenticate with GitHub or Twitter. Okay. And this recent news that you will somehow work with Google on their cloud platform, how is that going to work out? Okay, so the, the question was, we just had an announcement with Google that we're partnering to run OpenShift on Google Compute Engine, their GCE cloud. Um, so that'll mean that perhaps the next version of OpenShift Online, the version 3, will be running on Google's cloud and not Amazon's. Today it's on Amazon. And then if you want to use OpenShift dedicated, you'll have your choice of AWS, Google Compute Engine, or Microsoft Azure. We'll run in, in all three of those. And currently, um, does that mean that if I use the OpenShift online, uh, the, the free version, mm -hmm. you're actually paying for me uh, the Amazon yep. uh, web so services? So if you couldn't hear, it's like if I use the free version of OpenShift online, which anyone can use, 
you get up to three uh, gears or a gig and a half of memory. Do we actually have to pay Amazon for that? Yes, we do. It costs about $7 a month per user. Yeah. Thank you very much, then. Yes. <laughs> you can pay me afterwards. I, I, I get reimbursed. Um, so a lot of people ask why we do it, why we pay, because we have, uh, you know, a million, 1.8, it probably is two, 2 million now, applications running out there. Why do we do it? It's a lot of money for us. I, I don't. I know we're not one of the top Amazon EC2 users. Netflix probably kills us on that. But it is a. Uh, it's a significant amount of money that Red Hat uh, just pays for free hosting for people. Um, I like to think we do it because it encourages developers to uh, work on open source software and be able to publish their stuff quickly. Um, in reality, though, a lot of it's Bitcoin mining and stuff like that that people install on it that we have to turn off. Um, but what we really hope is that developers will start to use it and then want to use it inside of their company as well um, and want to get something on premise like Origin or Enterprise yep, around it makes externally. Sense. I have 57 software updates that I need to do. All right, so let's move on. So we have this route now. The next thing we're going to talk about is scaling. And you can scale in one of two ways. I show in the lab manual how to do it via the console. And uh, I am going, oh, and I also show how to do it in the web UI. Very easy to scale up in OpenShift. So let me go to my guestbook application and let's scale it up to four. And we'll see here in a second that it's starting to scale. And now we have four containers running all load balanced. So pretty quick to scale these things up. Um, my only ask is that because this is a shared environment, don't scale up to like 200 or anything um, because it'll like really bring the environment to a, a, a crawl because there's only five servers. But play around with it, scale it up, scale it down. Uh, I believe in the, uh, the workshop I provided a command to randomly kill. Maybe I didn't. I have a shell script that randomly kills like two or three pods, and you can see them come back. So here, just delete one manually, and you'll watch it comes back instantaneous. Like, because under the covers we use etcd. Are you guys familiar? Have you heard of etcd? etcd is a, a key value uh, database, key value store. And so we keep the state of what the uh, number of pods should be in etcd. And then each host, we check. And if it's ever out of sync or out of uh, uh, true, it's not true anymore, we immediately fix it. It takes about a second for us to realize that something bad has happened and to recover from it. So, you know, play around with that, delete a few pods, watch them pop back up. Yeah. Can you say it louder? Routing algorithm. Oh, uh, it's whatever you mean for the placement? Yeah, I mean, is it just route or it's not random. It's the default Kubernetes scheduler. If it automatically goes, if you scale up to two containers, it automatically uh, first goes to a different physical host, and it does that, and then it does a least used um, algorithm as well. So even if the next host, even if the, the next place is a, another physical machine, if the current host is less utilized, it puts it there. But it's the default Kubernetes scheduler is what we use. I've got an error saying that deployment config guestbook can be updated. The object has been modified. Mm, someone else must be using your Yeah, it seems like account. that. Is anyone using user one? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the only time I've ever Yeah, because someone, I just someone hit the button and someone one. scaled it up automatically no. to four, so. Yeah, that's what's going on. You can use your Thanks for playing, guys. <laughs> you can use user zero zero. Or user 50, use user 50. Good. Works now. Oh, mine did too. 
Maybe I'm using, no? Are you using user zero zero? Uh, no? No, that, that can happen sometimes if you press it really quickly. Oh, is that what it is? Yes. <laughs> so it's halfway through updating. Oh, I see. Okay. What Graham is saying is makes sense. If I do this, it's going to six, but then I do this, and sometimes it uh, the state is, is changing while the state has changed. Does that make sense? It's like a race condition. In the yeah, I know. I, I understand. Yeah, but for it. me, it just happened when I hit the button only once, but okay. That's why you should always use the command line. <laughs> oh, can you? <laughs> so I always get asked, can you scale down to zero? You can. Absolutely. You can scale it to zero. Can you? Yep. So now I have zero pods right. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give everyone Good. just a couple more minutes to play around with this, to kill some pods, and then we're going to move on. <laughs> Oh, one thing I should, probably should mention about scaling is um, in origin with the latest uh, merge, we incorporated the first code that will allow you to auto scale. Okay, so right now it's manual scaling. Right, you have to click the button or you have to use the command line. Um, so we do have the first auto scaling stuff in the open source repo now. now that will automatically scale initially based on, um, is it CPU utilization? Okay, CPU utilization. So you can set some rules and if your pod is using too much CPU, it'll actually scale out and, and start sharing it that way. Now the goal for that is to have it be a pluggable scaling architecture to where you can write your own scaling algorithm based on HTTP requests or disk I.O. or whatever the case may be. Um, so it'll automatically scale up and down at that point. All right, who in here loves Java? <laughs> All right. So we are going to be using Java for this next part. But you don't actually have to touch the code, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what I've done is I have created a geospatial application for mapping uh, coordinates uh, on a map, okay? Um, and I'm going to show you the application that we're going to be building. So let me go to uh, the, my web console, and let me go back to my projects and go to MLB Parks. This is a, a JE, Java EE application and a MongoDB database. MongoDB supports 2D spatial queries, box queries, uh, via JSON, so that's why we're using that. So if I click on this application, all it is is a map of the world, and it defaults to the United States, because what this application does is maps all of the baseball, Major League Baseball stadiums in the United States, okay? This is a very pluggable application. You can put in any coordinates you want and map soccer stadiums or whatever the case may be, or train stops or, or whatever. Okay, so every time I zoom in or out, it makes a rest call based on the longitude and latitude from the bounds of the browser. So it takes the coordinates mm -hmm. from here, 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 and here, and does a geospatial query based on those coordinates to find what's within it. And so you can, you know, zoom down all the way. It's just like Google Maps except open source. Okay, so this uses a, a, a tool called OpenStreetMap, which is a map of the world that you can use. It also, this web UI is um, Leaflet, Leaflet.js, and then the back end is uh, all written in, in Java. So if I scroll all the way down to Seattle, we can 
should eventually see the baseball stadium here. There it is. It's called Safeco Field. If you click on the little pin, it'll tell you the team name, their payroll, and what league they're in. So every time I do this, it's making a rest call that we're going to be creating. I should have centered it on, uh, or no, let's go over here. Where's your yeah. <coughs> We've got loads of um, baseball stadiums here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's nothing over here. Is this it? Am I in the right space? Yes. Uh, right, right. Where's Bruno? Move to the right. Here we go. Down, down, a bit. Too much. Oh, there's Bruno. <laughs> yes. Okay. Here's Bruno. We're somewhere here. So, so you can do it all over the world, right? So you can use this code to map whatever you want. So this is what we're going to be building. Um, let's go back to the lab. The first thing we're going to use is what's called source to image. So source to image is another open source project that we created on the OpenShift team because we feel that developers like to write code is this a fair, fair assumption? And they don't like to do Docker builds all day long. Okay? And so what we created was a source to image project that will take a Git repository or source code and a image name, maybe like JBoss or, or uh, Rails or Sinatra or Node.js or some language in runtime. We then take the source code provided, which is a Git URL, a base image, we build the source code, build a new Docker image on the fly that has your source code in it, and push that image to the registry. Okay, so developers can actually create and deploy Docker images without having to touch Docker or knowing anything about it. And that's what we're going to use in this lab is the source to image stuff. We're going to be using the JBoss EAP64 or something uh, base image, and then layering on top our source code it's going to uh, run a Maven build, which is the Java build system. It's going to take the artifact of that and inject it into the new container, or new image. And then we're going to run a container based off of that image, okay? So Complicated, so, yeah. So how does it work when I'm developing? Does it actually, when I'm changing the code, I have to rebuild everything to see um, the effect? What language do you use? JavaScript. Okay, so for interpreted languages, like PHP, uh, Node.js, whatever, we actually have an rsync uh, tool built into the platform. So I like to develop in PHP. And so what I do inside of my IDE is when I click the Save button in my editor, I have it run OC, or OC rsync, and that syncs my changed files over. And so it's instantaneous. Okay, For Java, that's not the case. Um, because in order to do something like that with a compiled language like Java, you're typically wanting to use something like JRebel, so you'd have to use something like that. Okay? If you're not using that, you will indeed have to run a new build every time. Okay? And can you use JRebel with uh, OpenShift? As long as there's a Docker container that they support, yes. We, we allow you to run any Docker container. Okay. So, oh, there's one thing before we get on this lab, because we are getting into these types of questions. Like, what do you do when you go home today? So if you still want to mess around with this, go to openshift.org slash vm. So uh, Jorge, in the back of the room, has created this all-in-one virtual machine that runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, that has the latest and greatest open source code that is completely open. You, you know how I said there were some security restrictions around running as root? That's disabled by default in this, so you can run any Docker container on it on your local machine just with Vagrant, with one command. Okay, so that's when you would want to try out like the... This is how I actually develop locally now. I just use this all-in-one image and use it as my development environment. Okay. Yeah. So how often is that box We update it. Yeah, with every release, yeah. yeah.
And so if you want more detailed instructions on how to do that, you remember that first blog post that we went to? That's what this blog post details, like how to actually run this thing, right? And so you'd want to come here and use that. So I can just download that image and put it into the virtual box? And yes. Yep. Up and, and running. Provide, up and running, yeah. It will provide the open shift. It provides open shift, yep. And the rail based images actually, I believe. So, but I still need to provide some other host for all. No, the way the host works is we use this uh, technology, not technology, this service called zip, xip.io. And so if we're in the console here, you can see I have a public URL. We create one of those using xip.io. So you don't have to mess with your host file or anything, and you'll be able to access your applications. They're not, it's only, it'll be available to any computer on your uh, subnet, I believe. Is it subnet or entire network? Entire network. But it won't be available to users outside of your network. Okay? All right, so let's actually get to building this application. We are going to use the uh, source to image. Here's the repo I want everyone to use. And in this lab, you have a decision to make, okay? I would prefer that you fork this repo. The reason I want you to fork it and use your version of it is because in a later lab, one of the great things about source to image is once you commit a change to your repo, OpenShift automatically can kick off a build and know that something has changed and automatically rebuild it. If you want to see that functionality, fork the repo and use your own version, because I'm not going to accept 50 pull requests to, to see this today. Um, and then you can change your repo and see an automatic, automated build get kicked off. Okay? So right. fork the repo and provide that as the... Uh, let me go back here. Let me show you one thing here. And I know people are going to do this, but when you create your app, uh, where is it? Make sure to use your repo and not mine. And also make sure <laughs> that you replace this, your user, with your actual GitHub user ID. Okay, if you fork it. This is not your OpenShift user ID, and it's not your user. It's your actual github.com user ID. Or you can just use mine, G Shipley, okay, if you don't want to fork the repo. Does that make sense? Is everyone familiar with GitHub? I normally teach this to, like, corporate developers who, like, work at a bank 9 to 5 and don't understand GitHub. So hopefully you guys do. But if you don't, let me know, and I'll help you. Yeah? Well, this might be a stupid question, but is it also working with GitLab? Oh, yeah, it works with any Git repository. Yeah, it can be a private, it can be GitLab, Bitbucket, uh, whatever. Yeah. And if you don't, one of the undocumented features of OpenShift, if you just have code locally, you can actually do OC, new app. This is pretty cool. And let's say I was working on PHP. I can pass in tilde dot, and it'll take whatever source code is in my current directory and use that, okay? Does it support secure shell authentication already? It, uh, well, no, not secure shell. What we have is this OCRSH, um, which does a remote shell, but it's basically the same I as... meant for the Git checkout. Oh, yeah, 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 of course, yes, yeah. Uh, how do I fork? Okay, um, once you're logged in, yes, I'm yeah, just click that button. And now it's this, and so this is your repo URL. Very good, then. Thanks. Yes. <coughs> yes. I have a very basic question. Um, so, where does OpenShift deploy the application, the Docker images? So. What is the hardware actually? Okay, so the question is, where is this stuff actually getting deployed? What does the hardware look like? Um, for this, today, this workshop, the hardware is five EC2 nodes that have 8 gig of memory 
and four CPUs. And so um, we support up to, I believe, 40 pods per host. So you're getting one of those hosts, and your pods are getting spread across. So we can configure all the CPUs and hardware you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can run OpenShift in a virtual machine. OpenShift actually also runs as a Docker container. So if you have boot to Docker and you want to run OpenShift, you can just do, uh, I, I don't, is it OpenShift slash OpenShift? Is that the Docker name? And then you can run it inside of a Docker container. So. Okay. This guy up here is already done because he's on the hard internet, right? <laughs> Okay, so the, the one thing with this lab, if you're not familiar with Java, why do people hate Java so much? I absolutely have no idea. Because it takes forever to do builds. Okay, so this build is actually going to take about five minutes because I'm using the Maven system and it basically downloads the entire internet as a dependency. Um, because I have all of these dependencies that depend on other things that depend on other things and so it, it does take a while to build so um, you can look at the logs in two ways I don't believe I show the logs in this lab from the command or from the console but I really like the new logs in the console so if I <coughs> once you get it deployed you can click on your pod here and you can click on uh, logs and this will open up the log and you can follow it, right? So you can just click on follow. And it's basically doing a tail on the logs in the console. I prefer that way. Um, so it's up to you. And you'll know the build is finished when it says pushing to uh, registry. In, Mayor. Sorry? What time is the this over? Now? No, how long does it last? Oh, uh, let me check. Twelve minutes? Seven. That's it? Is it nine or ten thirty? I thought it's a ten minute break after that so you can always run through. Okay. I'll wrap up in ten minutes. Sorry. We're just getting to the fun stuff. Yes. Hmm. I, I, so the goal of this lab or this workshop is to put you guys through a bunch of pain right here and then to have everyone hate me at the end because we can basically do all of these in one command and I'll show you that in just a few minutes. Okay. Uh, can you, so, so can you just uh, finish up the lab so that we can see it? These labs will be up and running. You can work on them all weekend. We'll I know, but I mean like can you, can you finish it off um, before our... Um, yeah, so I'll, I, yeah, in okay. front of us, so I understand. That we yeah. can see what's actually the goal of it. Okay, so I'll just uh, walk through this real quick. What we're doing right now is we're deploying the Java application, but it doesn't actually have a database yet. So in the next lab, we're creating a Mongo database Docker <coughs> container, and the most important thing to get out of this lab is that for authentication, when you're using Docker containers, it uses environment variables by default. That's kind of the standard um, with Docker containers. And so when you create uh, an application, we have this thing called a deployment config. The deployment config is the truth of your application. That's what, when we scaled up and down in the web browser, what it's actually doing is modifying this deployment config. Okay, all of your running pods has to match this deployment config. And so once we create the database, 
I just set some environment variables on the deployment config, and that ensures that every pod I spin up after that has those environment variables in it. So if I scale up to five uh, EAP servers, each instance of that has these environment variables to make that database connection. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we link them together here. We then look at the actual deployment config, and this is what the environment variables look like, nothing special. Um, and then I say OpenShift magic here, and that's because once we change this deployment config, OpenShift realizes your current running pod that we're building right now no longer matches this deployment config because it doesn't have those environment variables in it. So what it does is it kills that and spins up a new one that's correct. And then your application suddenly starts working. Okay? And it loads the data in and all this stuff. And it's really cool um, how it works. <laughs> but it is a pain to get all set up. Um, and I link into the source code that shows you how that works. Um, I show you how you can uh, SS, or not SSH, but get a shell on your container and actually run uh, Mon the Mongo binary client tool. And uh, lastly, once you have this application all up and running, which looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a developer, you've now done the effort to get your project running, but you want your teammate to be able to work on the same project with you, but you don't want him to go through all of this pain. Also imagine that you're a team of like five developers and you all work on a two or three projects and you hire a new developer. Normally it takes that new developer a couple days, sometimes a week to get their environment set up. And so what we provide is this thing called a template that you can create um, based off of the application once you have it running. Okay, And so this template is really the real power of OpenShift. And so instead of creating all of this uh, Java EE servers, cloning, forking the repositories, what we can actually do is create a new project. And I'll show you this. Go to my terminal here. I can say OC new project uh, user 00 template. And I can paste this command in which is OC create. So I'm going to create an object from a file. Mm -hmm. And a file can also be a URL, right? And I'm passing in this JSON file that is a template that defines my application. It's going to say, here's the Git repo um, that has the source code. Um, it needs MongoDB. Randomize the username and passwords. Um, and then modify the deployment config so it injects this password into every new pod. And I'm going to hit enter here. And now I have this template created, okay? So if I go back to the web console, if I go to my project overview, I'll see this template project. Mm -hmm. If I click on uh, add to project, we see that my MLB parks app shows up in this list and it just got reordered. So where did it go? Anybody see it here? I saw it when I first loaded it. You have to root all everyone sucks. Here it is. I just searched for it. So it actually adds it in the web a UI as well. And so then it can be used. But only in my namespace. Okay, there's, mm -hmm. there's this concept of namespaces. The uh, global namespace for everyone is called OpenShift. And so if you really wanted this to be available to anyone on the platform, you would have to add it to the OpenShift namespace by passing in dash n for namespace and say OpenShift. This is going to give me an error because I don't have permission to do that. I'm just a developer. I can't add things globally to the system. So you need to get your sysadmin to add this globally. But because it's available to me in my project, to create all of this nonsense that we're going to build over the next couple labs, I can just say OC new app MLB parks and it searches and sees that there's a template that I've loaded into the system and it's going to create all of this stuff. And then in a couple of minutes my entire project will be created. 
and you can see that it randomized the you know passwords and all of that stuff and so um, that's really how we envision teams using this is someone putting forth the effort to build out the uh, project from source code then creating a template that others can use okay so we're going to end there and I'll be here all day for questions. And then I think the next lab is Graham. Graham is on my team. He is also the author of uh, Mod Whiskey, the Python server. And he's going to be talking about uh, Python development in OpenShift, which Python's not really good. <laughs> Did you say whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> Mod Whiskey. He also calls it Malt Whiskey. So, there you go. Alright, thanks for coming, everybody. I appreciate your freedom. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, follow up with the continuous uh, 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 deployment. I mean, so this is just the one because we the only one. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, we're building on it all day. Okay. Yeah. Except, uh, I think maybe the next one is not the rest of the guys are going to be building on top of this stuff. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. Okay. Okay. So it's up, up to the yeah. Okay. Okay. pero vamos que en el en el escalar mí además no no fueron me creo que todos mil o algo así no no aporta nada pero en otros lados está escala más bien con aplicaciones sencillas no con la de Java con la de Java en otros está escala más bien con una aplicación de PHP Voy por un café, un importante de la siguiente. ¿Quieres algo? Oh, ¿Vas a estar todo el día aquí? Por lo menos. ¿Este era tuyo? Sí. Después, no sé, no me acuerdo la cabeza. Sí. I got an impression that uh, you actually have to, uh, you do have to have a GitHub or like uh, you have to push your source code into a publicly available repository to make it build. With OpenShift Online, you don't. Um, Because what I would, uh, I'm, I'm used to Google App Engine, and uh -huh. you just uh, you just build everything locally, and then you upload it. Yeah, upload so your with, binaries. With OpenShift Online, we require that you use Git, but we host it for you privately. So each account in OpenShift Online has their own Git server. Yeah, that that, uh, yeah. I, I was actually um, I meant just Git, not GitHub. Okay. And but that still means that I have to publish my uh, source code to sort of your service. Uh, 
Yes, we do also support binary deployments. Like if you have a war file or yeah, file, that, that would be exactly you can just what I drop like. it into the deployments directory. Is it possible? Awesome. And then that'll work. That would be excellent. Yeah, there's. I'm sure I've written blog posts on it. <laughs> okay, I'll dig yeah. it. Yeah. Are you in a, a Red Hat employee? No, I'm um, not. Oh, okay. I was gonna say we give. Uh, free accounts out to employees to do like 25 uh, containers. Yeah, unfortunately that, that was one of the reasons <laughs> why I consider it being yeah. a Red Hat employee. 25 containers for sale? For OpenShift Online, if you're an employee, you get an employee. Yeah. But, I, but I still can get the free version, well, don't I? Yeah. The, like the three yeah. pods or something, or gears. Yeah, just email. Um, no, I have, but they only gave me um, Whatever the next level up that silver oh, offers available, like, whatever. I can change it for you. I have exactly. access to it. I have, I have many. I don't use it either anymore. I, I've got my personal one, which I've got a couple of uh, a few websites crammed into one year. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have scarves apparently. I'll get called from all. Yeah. Alright, I'll be back tomorrow. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, you probably already have USBs, but uh, I'm being told um, that there were some uh, requests to perhaps have more, so I'm leaving you with a bag. Oh, okay. So the confusion last time we understood that the USBs were for something else. Yeah, so whatever you need them for, just use them if they're empty. Yeah, I don't need any If you don't, people. don't touch them, just okay. ignore them. They're there, though. One question missing. Okay, just follow what? Is it? Um, it's it's optional. That big enough to read?
as someone asked a minute ago, it's you can follow along and try and do some of the things I'm doing if you want. Um, if you're going to do that, it's better that you're in the previous workshop and have everything set up, because otherwise you sort of won't probably catch up. Um, but happy to just watch. You don't have to follow along. I've got all the information here that you can uh, go and uh, get various things down and do it, do it later if you want to dig into it. Sharing stuff around you, so if you don't need them, bleeding. Yeah. Um, was this your power? Or? Uh, no. Uh, how many were, of you here were in the last workshop with Grant? Okay, we got some. Um, so as I said, a minute ago, so a few people came in. Um, you do not have to follow through on this one. Um, if you did the previous workshop, you'll have all the environments set up so you can play if you want. Um, but I'm just going to demonstrate a few things. Uh, not a lot of hands-on stuff. And I'll just talk about a few other things. But you can go back later and... Uh, grab down our all-in-one VM which is mentioned at the bottom and, and play with it at home if you want. I'm getting a connection with you and I'm trying to download the client. I don't know what's wrong with that. This I can download that. Okay. Um, did you try to use the links that were in these? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the links are actually very good. So <laughs> I didn't read the the the. the yeah. So go down to the. Yeah. 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 We found that in the last lab. Uh, I should have said it is broken. 